Um, children and staff with vulnerable family members face very different risks in returning to school. Is it reasonable for these kids' families to want to keep them at home and how can schools ensure that they are both safe and learning? I mean, I think, I think we've got to give as good information as we possibly can to people. So somehow we've got to have a more grown-up conversation about risk, I think, and explain to families who, explain to families that the vast majority of, of, of children will in fact be better back at school and safer back at school um, at, for a whole variety of reasons, including the ability, frankly, for parents to be able to work and bring and, and, and support their families. So um, for me, it's we've got to get it down to the absolute minimum number. Um, and certainly, certainly I know um, if I think about the university here, we are trying to describe very clearly who is in who remains in a vulnerable category because it's actually a very small group of people who really remain in a, in a vulnerable category. Mm. Um, your type. I mean, that, that said, what we all have to be is, is flexible if we get another spike, but, but we need to get, I think there's a real danger that we don't get the maximum number back in September. So I, I sort of come from the other way, which is to say there has to be a good reason not to come back, um, a really, really good reason. And, 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 you know, that may sound a bit hard hearted, but I actually think it's the right position to be in. Thank you. Matt, do you want to add to that? Um, so so I, I agree with everything that Sally just said there. Um, I suppose I just want to add a caution about uh, making lazy assumptions about why certain families might not be sending their pupils back. And this is the sort of tabloid slapstick lazy assumption, particularly directed at um, low income families who um, might be making very rational, very logical decisions that we would all make if we were in their shoes. That is, if you are the single mom who is the only breadwinner in your family, um, and you're very aware that if you're unable to earn money, um, your family's going to be in an increasingly precarious position, is a perfectly logical thing to do to try and minimise the risk of anybody in your family contracting COVID. And um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be encouraging them to come back into school because we think it's safe. Um, but the point that Sally made about explaining and reassuring and supporting parents to get their pupils, uh, to get their kids back into school as pupils is really critical. And we need to avoid very lazy assumptions about why individual families might not be doing that because um, they are often, in my experience, and you know, I'm chair of governance at a school that serves an incredibly low-income community in a seaside town in the northwest of England. Like those parents are making very logical decisions that are in the interests of them and their families, and we need to be careful about stigmatizing them for doing things that we ourselves would do if we were in their circumstances. Thank you, Tilly. I mean, I just really echo what what Sally and Matt have have said. I think. Having spoken to parents recently who have similar concerns, they all want their children to come back. Like they're not saying, oh, I don't want them to come back. They do, but they have to make these decisions. And, and I can't imagine what a difficult uh, decision it must have to be to decide between um, what you consider keeping your family safe and what they consider a really important part of their child's education, which is sending them back to school with all the other children. So I think we need to be really careful not to think that these families don't want their children to go back. I think in a lot of situations and in the vast majority, I would say they do, but they need to make the right call for their family in their situation. 